Who started the Great Schism, the split between the present-day Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches? This seems like a question that can only be answered with years of research and poring over many books. Here, we endeavour upon a concise answer, one which is not shallow, but truly gets to the heart of the matter. How can we do this? First, we must understand what the church is. After all, the historical question of who started the schism is not merely pedantic, but it contains certain theological presuppositions relevant to the religious body it pertains to. Only after this question is answered can one determine what schism in the church is, and then how the Great Schism formed. The Church views itself according to the Constantinopolitan Creed as one, holy, catholic, and apostolic. Other early Church Fathers, like St. Gregory the Great, sometimes call the Body of Christ the Orthodox Church. He says, For, though the whole earth was filled with the observance of the true faith by the preaching and doctrine of the Apostles, yet the Orthodox Church of Christ, having been founded by apostolic institution and most firmly established by the faithful fathers, is further built up through the teaching of divine discourses. To it did all the most blessed apostles endowed with an equal participation of dignity and authority convert hosts of peoples. The patristic consensus, something that pertains to the agreement of all the saints of the church, is that the church was begun by Jesus Christ with the ordination of the apostles to the title of bishop through Saint Peter. Though these apostles had equal dignity and authority, Church tradition teaches that Peter literally ordained the other apostles to their bishoprics. To quote John of Thessalonica's apocryphal account of a conversation between Saint Peter and the other apostles, Peter picked up a palm branch and said to John, You are the virgin apostle. It is your duty to sing hymns before the beer, holding this. Then John said to him, You are our father and bishop. It is your duty to be before the beer until we bring it to the place of burial. In this way, every bishopric is between and ultimately sourced in Jesus Christ himself. In the early church, it was understood that all bishops succeeding from the apostles were part of this church, provided they did not pack up their bags and leave. The fathers, who are those saints from whom the patristic consensus is derived, are unanimous when defining schism, that it is the act of both cutting oneself off from communion and setting up a parallel jurisdiction or church where the church already is. In Catholic theology, the theology both sides of the Great Schism ascribe to, it is necessary to follow the consensus of the Fathers and uphold the faith which has been believed everywhere, always, by all. For that is truly and in the strictest sense Catholic, according to Saint Vincent de Lorraine. In the words of Saint Pope Celestine, quoted by Vincent in support of the before stated rule, let novelty cease to assail antiquity. For the Catholic, one's definition of schism must be how the fathers defined it, otherwise it is definitionally uncatholic. When determining who started the Great Schism, the contemporary criterion of Catholicity may seem quaint, but it is important to understand as it would be meaningless to discern who started a church-specific problem between Catholics by the name of schism using standards that were not accepted by both sides. And so, discerning Catholicity via patristic consensus is not an arcane theological presupposition which is only relevant to theologians, but it is the only historically legitimate way to answer the question. And so, many people who follow current events often do not understand the proceeding. So they often confuse local breaks in communion as equivalent to a categorical schism as typified by the Great Schism. Such local schisms, where there is a break between two individual churches, yet while these churches were often in communion with other churches who were not in schism with either side, was fairly common in the early church. The Easter controversy, Miletian schism, and the Constantinople-Rome schism during the 11th century did not break communion categorically between all churches. In the latter case, Alexandrine communion with Rome persisted until the 13th century. The Fathers never confused such local breaks in communion with what they considered as schism. This is because schism had a predictable historical pattern. 
all of the notorious schismatics the fathers were writing against, such as Novation, a counter bishop of Rome, and Donatus, a counter bishop of Carthage, not only went into schism in their local cities, but they spread their schism by ordaining bishops in parts of the church that have not left the fold. For example, the Novatians ordained bishops to replace those who did not recognize the legitimacy of his bishopric throughout the Roman Empire. The Donatists ordained parallel bishops throughout North Africa and even in Rome itself after a dispute broke out over Sicilian of Carthage's ordination to the bishopric. In the words of St. Augustine, the Donatists should have warned themselves, The great scandal of schism within the church may arise and we may be found presuming to set up another altar, not against Sicilianus, but against the universal church which would still hold communion with him. Why did the early church consider this particularly grievous? In the early 2nd century, St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote, Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude also be. Even as, wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Hence, to install a schismatic bishop where a bishop already appears was understood to be definitionally un-Catholic, because it in effect cut one off from all the other Christian believers within the one body of Christ. To quote St. Paul, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body being many are one body, so also is Christ. These may sound like theologically loaded terms, but the consensus pertaining to this theology informed how the early church operated and understood schism. Let's use a historical case study that demonstrates the preceding theology at work. In the 4th century, Saint Meletius, the Bishop of Antioch, was sent into exile during the Arian controversy. Lucifer Cagliari of Sardinia single-handedly ordained Paulinus II as Bishop of Antioch. This is considered uncanonical or illegal within ecclesiastical law, something that is documented to have existed since at least the 3rd century. In any event, Alexandria and Rome recognized Paulinus in place of Miletius, and so Miletius did not commemorate them. This is known today as the Miletian Schism. After the death of Miletius, St. Flavian was ordained to replace him and was recognized by the First Council of Constantinople, the largest representative body of the Church's views during its day. St. Pope Damasus I and then St. Pope Siricius and other Italian bishops did not recognize Flavian, even though St. Theophilus of Alexandria and even bishops in Illyricum, who were under Roman jurisdiction, later did. This vindicates Miletius and Flavian, who are recognized by both Roman Catholics and Orthodox as saints, and not Paulinus, Evagrius, and other Paulinian successors. Sometime in the late 390s, Rome finally re-entered into communion with the canonical Church of Antioch. The preceding episode illustrates how a schism began, Roman Alexandria not recognizing Miletius, and how it was ultimately consummated, Roman Alexandria entering communion with the parallel bishopric in Antioch. The schism was only healed by re-entering into communion with the canonical church of Antioch and ceasing recognition of the parallel jurisdiction. This historical example is especially important as the authority of an ecumenical or church-wide council and the veneration of saints, which both sides, Roman Catholic and Orthodox, accept, delineates the correct and incorrect parties in this matter according to the standards applicable to each side. Before answering the question of who started the Great Schism, it is also important to discuss how the early church understood episcopal hierarchy and jurisdictional boundaries. The ancient church has always been organized around a local bishop, with each local church having oftentimes one or more bishops. As early as the first century, one can surmise that some bishops, like St. Titus, were set above other bishops over a certain geography, such as those in Crete. While implications of hierarchy within the episcopacy can be inferred from St. Irenaeus' writings, they are made explicit during the 3rd century. For example, St. Dionysius of Alexandria wrote in a dispute with Pope St. Stephen I, Moreover, in judging of and dealing with particular cases, we give instructions to the local primates who, under divine imposition of hands, were appointed to discharge these duties, for they shall give a summary account to the Lord of whatsoever they do. As one can see, the Bishop of Alexandria gives instructions to the local primates. This presupposes a hierarchical superiority within specific geographic jurisdictional boundaries. Apostolic Canon 34, which was likely dated to the 2nd or 3rd century, also speaks of hierarchy between the bishops within a given geography. The bishops of every nation must acknowledge him who is first among them and account him as their head, and do nothing of consequence without his consent. 
but neither let him who is the first do anything without the consent of all. For so there will be unanimity, and God will be glorified through the Lord in the Holy Spirit. It should not be a surprise that before Christianity was officially tolerated by St. Constantine and made the state religion by St. Theodosius, bishops were organized among provincial lines within the Roman Empire, with a hierarchical structure that corresponded generally with the precedence of a certain city and or province within that empire. This had practical implications, but it is hardly a spiritual criterion. Theologically, the location of an apostle's relics within a given city played the largest role in justifying its importance. This theological criterion did not always outweigh practical considerations, as Jerusalem, for the first few centuries, had their bishopric in Aelia, and Constantinople's founding Saint Andrew was marked in a whole other city. Later church canons, as propagated by ecumenical councils such as Canon 3 of Constantinople 1 and Canon 28 of Chalcedon, explicitly invoked the practical criterion when delineating church jurisdiction. The theological criterion was never canonized. Where did these church jurisdictions come from so that their boundaries can be subject to future disputes? It may be difficult to picture this in one's mind, but few appreciate that due to most churches being traditionally started and administered by Saints Peter and Paul, theologically this would mean that due to their relics being in Rome, the Roman bishop would be first among these churches. Additionally, this would give Rome geographically by far the largest jurisdiction in the ancient church, as Saint Paul was by far the most successful evangelizer in church history. Nevertheless, tradition and correspondence between bishops demonstrates that jurisdictions in North Africa, Egypt, and the Middle East functioned independently with the consent of all, including Rome. In the event where jurisdiction over a locality was disputed, such as Rome's alleged local jurisdiction over Ephesus during the 2nd century Easter controversy, matters were solved through discerning a church-wide consensus. In the background of this controversy was the fact that Ephesus was arguably a Pauline city as it was started by St. Paul's missionary work. Theoretically, this would make Ephesus under Roman jurisdiction. However, tradition in Ephesus taught that the city was the last known whereabouts of St. John, making the city Joannine and the head of all Joannine churches, thereby independent of Rome. As stated previously, from the beginning of church history, there was a hierarchy between bishops which was geographically based, and the means of resolving jurisdictional disputes was through appeals to the world's churches so there would be common consent among Christians. Eusebius records that local bishops throughout the world weighed in on the question, in his words sharply rebuking the Bishop of Rome for his attempt to excommunicate churches in Asia Minor, as one cannot actually excommunicate someone when it is not in his power to do so. Local synods throughout Christendom addressed the Pope's excommunication dismissively despite their agreement with Rome over the date of Easter, as their consent to resolving what was viewed as an inter opposed to intra church dispute was considered necessary. The same regional approach to church wide resolution of disputes in lieu of an ecumenical council happened several times during the 3rd century in response to controversies pertaining to Novatianism, Rebaptism, and Paul of Samosata's deposition. After the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea in the early 4th century, politically and socially the Mediterranean world was changing considerably as the borders of the Roman Empire were in flux. The Sassanid Empire largely subjugated the church within their borders after the Council of Seleucia Stesiphon, and this later formalized into a schism. The Arab Caliphate likewise did the same among religious sectarians in the Near East and Egypt. In any event, the regional borders of Roman jurisdiction, intact in the Balkans and southern Italy since the missionary work of St. Paul, generally did not change. However, a cultural estrangement between East and West began to set in. The speaking of Latin in the East continually declined, with Latin no longer being recognized as the language of Byzantine government during the reign of Heraclius in the 7th century. Yet Rome, which had been under Byzantine occupation since the 6th century, largely had Greek popes until the mid-8th century. Greek was used by many, and some allege most, Roman clergy during this period. Byzantine occupation was generally not friendly as popes were regularly intimidated and arrested, sometimes martyrs such as Saint Pope Martin I. Usually some theological heresy served as a pretext for the worst abuses. During Byzantium's descent into iconoclasm, a religious policy intolerant of the veneration of icons, historically Roman territories in the Balkans and southern Italy were legally seized and transferred to Constantinople's jurisdiction. 
This was possible because in the late 7th century, the majority of churches accepted the 38th canon of the Council of Trullo. If any city be renewed by imperial authority or shall have been renewed, let the order of things ecclesiastical follow the civil and public models. In other words, imperial authority can change ecclesiastical boundaries to follow the civil and public models. Due to the Byzantine Empire having authority in the Balkans and southern Italy, the transfer was deemed canonically legitimate. When the Lombards successfully wrestled northern Italy from Byzantine hands in 751, Byzantium's ability to control Rome disappeared as Rome sought Frankish protection from the Lombards. Adding to this estrangement was the fact that after this the popes were no longer Greek and the Franks encouraged an independent, anti-Byzantine posturing. In any event, Rome up to this point had accepted the canons of Trullo. In the words of Alexander Bogolopov, Pope Hadrian wrote, All the six councils I received, with all the canons which were rightly and divinely promulgated by them, and as an example of these canons, he referred to Canon 82 of the Trullan Council, concerning the depicting of Christ as a lamb. Therefore, when the Seventh Ecumenical Council, with the consent of the Papal Legates, recognised the canons of the Six Ecumenical Councils, this meant that the Trullan Council was also recognised among them. However, there was undoubtedly a difference in interpretation, as Rome continually requested the restoration of Roman jurisdiction, until Pope John VIII dropped these requests and recognised Constantinopolitan jurisdiction in these lands in exchange for a military alliance against the Saracens. In any event, no schism began over the issue of jurisdictional changes, as they were affirmed in canon law and consented to by all parties involved. Amidst these territorial considerations, serious doctrinal changes were afoot and the Western churches began adopting the filioque in their creed. The creed, a reference to the Constantinopolitan creed, was understood to be a necessary confession of the Christian faith and regulative of popular belief. Changing it was tantamount to forswearing the common faith of the church. Yet this change was something that initially did not create a schism as it was understood in the West according to St. Maximus, that the filioque did not contradict the universal belief that the Father was the sole eternal cause of the Holy Spirit. As time persisted, it became clear that many Western bishops no longer believed this, as evidenced by the infighting between Pope Adrian I and the Frankish theologians exactly on this point at the turn of the 8th century. By the next century, this escalated into a break in communion between Constantinople and Rome amidst political squabbles. The break was only healed when Pope John VIII, as verified in multiple letters of his in both Latin and Greek, a fact that demonstrates these letters are not forgeries, affirmed the reunion of Council of Constantinople in 879 to 880, and recognised only the creed without the filioque as required by that council in multiple letters, one being Defotius, the Bishop of Constantinople. The earliest Latin canonists such as Ivo Chartreux and Gratian likewise considered the Photian Synod of 879-880 to have been duly approved by Pope John VIII, citing Latin letters to this effect. Only later did Western historians and canonists, in opposition to all extent primary sources, change their estimation of the course of events. While the 879-880 Council appeared to disallow Latin Christians from using the filioque, it was obviously not interpreted this way by Western churches as, outside of John VIII, the Council had little support in the West. Nevertheless, Rome itself abided by the agreement as they had not changed the creed up to that point. To quote Pope Leo III, who wrote during the turn of the 8th century, It, the filioque, may be sung in teaching and be taught by being sung, but neither by writing nor by singing may it be unlawfully inserted into that which it is forbidden us to touch. Latin theology had accepted the existence of the filioque and allowed it to be taught by being sung, but they officially did not put it in the creed. In the Council of Constantinople, the Roman and Eastern churches made a truce which had maintained the status quo preceding the break in communion. Eastern bishops believed they had prevented the filioque from being expounded. Rome admitted that on an official level the East was correct, but the Council did not specifically enough condemn their peculiar doctrine. When discerning the issue of schism, the obvious question is who broke the truce, and whether what they did after the truce was broken fits the definition of schism discussed before. Using these criteria, scholarship and partisans on both sides of this issue agree that the Western faction of the church is to blame on both counts. In the early 11th century, the Roman church unilaterally changed the creed, something the truce disallowed for. Then they excommunicated Constantinople for allegedly removing the filioque from the original creed, amongst other things. 
This allegation is historically inaccurate, and it demonstrates which side started a fight in violation of an earlier truce. At the same time, the Normans conquered Byzantine Italy and with the ascent of Rome replaced its Constantinopolitan bishops, introducing a parallel Latin bishopric alongside Greek bishops who served southern Italy's Greek population. They also imposed Latinization, including the imposition of the Filioque. This was both heretical and schismatic, as it propagated the Germanic as opposed to the traditional Latin view of that doctrine. It can be legitimately argued that Italian Christians largely consented to their new episcopacy, and so this muddies the waters as to this being the origin of the Great Schism. However, the Western side was decisive in exacerbating matters during the Crusade, which followed soon thereafter. Western Christians, with papal support, repeatedly installed parallel bishops and enforced liturgical changes including the creed sometimes in locales they had not even conquered. This includes setting up parallel churches in Jerusalem and Antioch in the 12th century, the Aegeans, Constantinople and Alexandria in the 13th century, Baltic, Balkan, Russian, Ukrainian and Greek lands in the 13th through 17th centuries. In effect, the papacy through their ordinations and expounding of the Filioque created another church in places where there were already bishops who had belonged to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church as St. Vincent defined it. They likewise had different doctrines to that same church. The Roman Church had clearly consummated a schism, becoming a new, independent Christian body, and they did so with the use of force. Contrarily, the Eastern Churches never ordained bishops in a Roman Catholic land until the 19th century or took part in any forced conversions of the Roman Catholic laity until forced to by Stalinist persecutions in the 1940s, a point so far after the schism that one cannot accuse them of creating parallel bishoprics within the same church. Hence, while one can disapprove of the proceeding, definitionally they would not meet the criteria for schism. And so, if one seeks to answer historically who caused the Great Schism, according to the criteria of the actual members of the church where the schism occurred, it must be discerned that the Roman church is to blame. They changed their doctrine of the Filioque, broke a truce not to add it to the creed, excommunicated Eastern Christians over this doctrine, amongst others, and ultimately attempted replacing Eastern bishops without their consent, making a second church. Religious divisions as the result of papal policy since the Crusades have significantly shaped history and persist to this day.